Hi, my name is Robert, and I'm going to talk about the Levy factor and also the force which is needed for a Levy failure. In our project, we are mostly talking about the um, type of Levy, which is uh, they are clay field Levy and also the sand field Levy. The only difference between these two is just the height and the width of the Levy in each different levy systems they are mostly like a typical levies which they're just different in height and width the other section that just need to be talked about is the continuity relationship of the channel which when the levy just break down if you divide them by three part part one two and three the part one and part two and three, they are continued relationship gonna be put in, which they are all equal to each other. There are several factors which need to be put in consideration in designing the levy, which are the foundation preparation, the constructed area and sediment and stability, and also the seepage, which is interior drainage, and also the erosion of the levy, which due to height and channel velocity. There also the photo of the levy stability failure is provided, which you can see. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Kyle Schmidt, and I will be talking about how the static integrity affects the levy failure rate. Levies are known to fail under one or more of the following loading situations. Ground shaking from seismic activity, high water level, and static stresses. Ground shaking failures is a result of a levee experiencing bearing, sliding, and or slip spread of sediment. High water failure is a result of sliding, slip spread of sediment, seepage, erosion, and or overtopping of water. Static failure is a result of sliding, slip, slump spread of sediment, seepage, and or erosion. As seen in this figure, high water level is the most significant loading situation by which levees fail. High water levels against a levee in the Bay Area Delta are influenced by three components. Inputs from river, the tidal fluctuation of the Pacific Ocean, the engineering features that modify flow rate within the system. High water levels occur from December through February. This correlates with the highest expected tides in January and the highest rainfall runoff. This high level combined with a rapid water level down drawdown can destabilize levees. This systematic drastic change from water levels of high to low increases the rate of erosion on the levee's surface, leading to formations of small cracks or pitting in the levee's walls. These cracks or pitting lead to seepage in the lower levees, lower level of the levees, which compose of sand layers. Such seepage leads to further erosion of the interior structure. Such water levels changes are also coupled with high velocity flow. High velocity flow increases the rate in which the material of the water side of the levee erodes. This erosion increases as the cycle of high to low water levels change over the course of a storm cycle. Like high water levels, this erosion has a continuous effect on the level of levees, causing catastrophic failure. Hello, my name is Mohammed Mostagin, and I'll be talking about how the flow rate of the water affects the levees. When water is traveling at higher speeds, it can erode the levee at a higher rate, causing the water to overtop or undercut the levee. Overtopping of the levee is when the water, is, water level is higher than the levee itself, so water will begin to flow overtop the levee at high velocity, but the initial slope of the body of water to the floodplain will be high. When the water flows at high velocity, it can cause higher rates of erosion possibly causing a channel through the levee. The high velocity can also cause a high rate of erosion along the inner parts of the levees, which can lead to undercutting and slumping of the levee. The increase of levels of the water can also cause an increase of fluid pressure, which may result in seepage, where water is pushed through the levees and, out, uh, and comes out as springs on the sides of the floodplains. If the flow rate of the water is high, then the water may erode the material under the levee, damaging it, causing it to fail. This process is called piping.
in each of these cases, the water flow rate uh, will play a key role uh, for it can speed up erosion and eventually lead to the failure of the levee. To show how the flow rate of the water will affect the levee, we will take a look at a situation where the levee is in contact with high velocity of water. Uh, we will use the momentum equation, which is F equals to M dot V, which also uh, equals to A times rho times velocity squared. In our example, we will say that the rho is the rho of water at 1,000 kilograms per meters cube, and the velocity will be stated in our two examples, which we have in example one, where velocity is 2 meters per second, where our force equals to be 4 kilonewtons. And in example two, we have velocity is 10 meters per second, and our force equals to 100 kilonewtons. As we can see, uh, with a higher velocity, our uh, force will be higher, and as a result, erosion will occur at a much faster rate, causing the levee to fail. Hi, my name is Cody Brown, and I'll be talking about the equations that we need to use to determine the horsepower in a pump that is pumping flooded water back to the rebuilt side of the levee. We'll start this by equation one, which we would know the amount of flood water on the flooded area. We'd also know the amount of pumps that would be <coughs> used in this situation. We'd also be given a time constraint that we'd have to work with, which would uh, allow us to solve for the flow rate. Once we have the flow rate, we could solve using continuity, because we know the diameter of the pipe, for a velocity. Once we have the velocity, we can move to equation 2 and solve for a Reynolds number. We would do this by plugging in the velocity we just found in equation 1, and for V, we would know the diameter of the pipe, and we'd also know the kinematic viscosity of the fluid that we are pumping, in this case, water. That would give us a Reynolds number, which would correspond to either laminar or turbulent. If it's uh, laminar, we would use equation 3. If it's turbulent, we would use equation 4. In both cases, we'll be solving for the friction factor, little f. Once we solve either equation 3 or equation 4, we can move to equation 5 and solve for the head loss. By plugging in the friction factor, little f, that we just found in equation 3 or 4, we know the length of the pipe, L. We know the diameter of the pipe. We also know the the <coughs> velocity of the fluid water uh, pumping through the pipe that was solved for in equation one. We also know the gravitational constant. That would give us the head loss overall for this system. Moving on, we can move to equation six, where we can cancel off P1 and P2 because both of the bodies of water are open to the atmosphere. We can also cancel out the V1 and V2 portions of the equation because the velocities um, of the bodies of water are large and going to be moving slow enough that we can consider them zero. Next, we know the height uh, elevation change between the, two flo the flood body and the rebuilt side of the levee. And plugging in the HL that we just found in equation 5, we can solve for HS. Once we have HS, we can solve for the amount of work done because of uh, equation 7, which is gamma, a given that we would know. Q, which was solved for in equation 1, and the HF that was just determined with the energy equation in 6. Once you have this number, you can divide by 550, and that will give you the overall horsepower in the pumps desired.